Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk about this work here. Can everyone hear me? I tend to talk to the people. But if you can't hear me, tell me, and I will speak louder, then I will speak softer. And then you have to tell me again, and I'll, I'll speak louder again. That's, that's how it works, because I, I, I tend to forget so that other people are in the room. So, uh, yeah, so this is, a, this is a talk about geometry, really more than uh, physics, hope you won't mind. Um, and it's, it's joint work with Yannick. So, I, so I'd like to talk to you about a new, a new result we've just got in this, in this, um, in this complex of SSI. Trying to see how they can arise from projective grounds. So the result is, what is this talk about? So we're going to be looking at a manifold boundary. I will always write M to the dot zero on the top there, for the interior, and then the boundary the M. And we're going to assume we have a projectively compact metric on the interior. Then so the standard result is, is that the boundary then splits up into curved orbits. So we have the uh, curved orbit that corresponds Null infinity, and then we have um, these are not what you call ties by and square. So try and find what you call well, try and find. So these are like the bases of these tie and square pictures. So the new result is, is that we can do this, we can construct these over this boundary in a canonical way, and we can also get a projective structure. Determined from the data on the inside, uniquely, that this is a holonomy reduction for Carolian geometry, strong Carolian geometry, uh, Cartan geometry. So just to, just to be clear on that point, so my I'm a Cartan and geometry enthusiast. So whenever I talk about structures, I'm saying there's a structure and it's a Cartan geometry. That's what I mean. I mean the Cartan geometry, not necessarily the, the description of it in terms of things. No, that manifold. Okay, so hopefully that's completely unclear to you. You'll ask lots of questions as I move through the talk, and now I'll try to make this statement clear about what I mean, and what I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to speak louder. Sorry. Um, so th that's where I want to get to, and I hope that by the end of the talk you'll understand what I'm talking about. And if you're normal, if you're not, that would be. So first, I thought I'd remind you about projective structures. I don't know how, how you know how, how well versed you are in, in, this, in this sort of thing. So a projective structure on a manifold is an equivalence class of torsion-free affine connections that have the same unparametrized geodesics. So you have your geodesics; they're the same, but you forget about so you forget about proper time, you forget about their dynamics. You just keep this in there. And this happens when you have this nice relationship here. In the two connections. And if and only if statement, this is the result that's always attributed to chaos. And I, I haven't actually found, I've never found the original article yet. This is, um, this is what it means for two conne affine connections to have the same up to reparametrization. There is a one form such that the derivative, the covariate derivative of the first is written in this way. That's what a projective structure is. And the simplest example to start off with is the projective sphere. A sphere. I've drawn a sphere, but we could really think about this as being the ray projectivization of Higgins space. Projective space. That means that we all the lines are in the same on the same on the same ray. I keep pressing this thing and it's not doing anything. It's not very good with my hands. So everything that's on this ray here is the same. These points are all identified. It's not the line. So we don't identify antipodal points. That makes it a little bit easier to describe and imagine what we're talking about. So there's no quotient. It's not the projective space. 
Okay, and so we can see it has a natural projective structure. So the geodesics are the great circles, which are, of course, the geodesics of the round metric, the standard metric on the sphere. And if you project down, sensorily project down this here, you see that they get mapped lines. So at least on each of these hemispheres here, these are projected the equivalence of a flat dimension. So you can ask questions if it's not, if I'm saying anything that's kind of clear to anybody. Okay, so no, no questions, I'll move on. Okay, so actually there's some more things I want to say on this slide. So they, here this is, this XA is gonna be an important object. So it's just the uh, homogeneous coordinates, it's the radial direction here. And I'm gonna think of this as an object that lives on, on a bundle <coughs> over the sphere, so on a trivial bundle over. So this is an important object. I, I won't say much more about what it is for now. Just keep in mind, whenever you see an X, that means homogeneous coordinates. Okay, so as I said, I was a Cartan geometry enthusiast, and this is Cartan geometry way of thinking is behind all this, the way that advancing through the work, it's much easier to think in these terms, in my opinion. And so a projective structure in this classical sense is equivalent to the given to the, the, the data of a normal Cartan, a unique normal Cartan projective geometry. Now I'm going to say a bit more about what I mean by that because this is a concept that's fundamental to the thinking behind the work. The fact that there is a, there is a homogeneous model. Cartan is geometry modeled on a structure. What do I mean by that? So I take two. So in general, I'm going to piece of chalk. So uh, have B group G, and you choose close subgroup. Get the wrong way around, sorry about that. And you consider the quotient space. This is what I mean by homogeneous space. I mean a description of some geometry as a quotient space G over H. You know many of those as, for example, I guess the most relevant here would be Lorentzian geometry. G is your Poincare group and it's H Lorentzian. Uh, yes, sorry. I'm just used to N being whatever I need it to be. <laughs> so there it is, sorry. So this is your, okay, this is your classical description. So uh, Lorentzian geometry is a Cartan geometry model. Projective geometry is a Cartan geometry modeled on the projective space. So you take the projective group and the stabilizer of a point. That's always what it is. G is H is always a stabilizer of a point because G acts transitively. Okay, so how do we generalize this to a, to a curved setting? How do we make what we call a Cartan geometry? Well, we replace, everything's modeled on this projection here that you have. Canonical projection, this thing here, G, if you think of it like this, behaves like a H, an H principle bundle. I don't know if everyone is familiar with that language. Fine. Yes. Yeah, the coach to GLN plus one, I, I, I got it centered. Gives you your projective. Sorry, yes. Then you work out the point. Okay, so the idea of a Cartan geometry is in some sense is that you take, you have this projection in the model, you're going to replace G by a principal bundle. So you're going to lose the left multiplication, but you still keep a trace of left multiplication through uh, a generalized more Cartan form, which is the Cartan connection. Okay, and the Cartan connection behaves a lot like a principal connection, 
so that it's not a principal connection because it takes its values in G, in the D algebra of G, and not the D algebra of H, although this is an H principal bundle. And it verifies this important hypothesis of absolute parallelism. There's an nice <coughs> a vector space isomorphism between the tangent spaces of the bundle and So that's what I mean by pattern geometry. So that's the sort of thing I have in mind. Okay. So you, you, you do know principal bundles. So you, you, know, you know the best, the, the easiest, the one that makes everything clear when you're trying to learn about these things is the frame bundle, which is just a GLNR bundle. Each, each of the fibers at each point is just a set of maps, convertible maps from Rn into the tangent, into the tangent space. The choice of the, of the and so this thing is, is sort of like a general version of that. Okay, so that's just to, to clear things up. So there will be Cartan geometries lurking in the background of this thing, but I will only be describe them with their homogeneous model. That's what I mean by homogeneous. Okay. So first thing I'm going to explain is the first part of the statement, which is the result of travel decomposition to its trappings and deliver. So you start out with your projective sphere. So I'm going to give it to you how it works in the model and then tell you that it works in the trapping. So in the model, what do we do? We start out with our projective sphere with its standard projective structure. And now we introduce other objects and demand that the group preserves these objects so what we introduce, if we introduce a covector here, a constant covector, then and we ask the group, so we're going to reduce the projective group, calling it a R here, and I'm assuming some volume. So I ask this group to preserve this covector, and what will happen is that instead of acting transitively on the sphere, it will start acting, it will start having different orbits. So it would split the sphere up into two hemispheres, which are both morphic to diffeomorphic to, to a plane, and then we get a third orbit, which is called the plane. And this would be describing sort of a compactification of affine geometry. Here you would get the affine group acting here. So this group here, when you reduce it to this, it starts acting like the affine group on these two. Here you get another projective structure. Okay, sorry. I'll just keep on speaking louder. Okay, so this is the first example of a, of a, cur of a curved orbit decomposition. So there's a way of generalizing this case when you get curved orbits in the same way. And we can see that this orbit decomposition is given by a thing here that looks like this. A projective density. So what I do is I just take homogeneous coordinates and I... I Pack them into the into the thing. So the index index up there somehow has gone up. It should be down. Sorry, <laughs> no, it's, that that should be down. Okay, and so this this thing here, this is another fundamental concept that I'm going to be talking about is the notion of density, projective weight. See, this is not a function on the sphere because it's the scale with the homogeneous coordinates. So when I when I multiply the homogeneous coordinates by one, I don't change the point by uh, by a, a, a positive number. I won't change the point, and but this thing will see that because it will be homogeneous of degree one. So this is a density of weight. Okay, so densities will be popping up quite all over the place in things because these these are the natural objects. The natural objects of the sphere, and so the. the the only thing that so the only thing that really makes any sense is the sign and the where it's where it's actual value depends on the frame zero and this is why I get this. okay so now we want to start to make this looking a lot more like physics so we need we want to have a metric we want to have we don't want affine space here you want Lorentz Lorentz in sp your Minkowski space. So how do we get that? Then we demand that 
the subgroup preserved as well as the thing with the, uh, the covector here preserve this metric here that turns out to say this degenerate. When we do this, we work out the groups. Uh, we still, so now the, the equator spits up, so it's no longer, the, the group number act, no longer acts transitively on the, on the equator, and we get three types of orbits, which are the three things that I've presented earlier. So we get so something here that, so I will make this clear in another drawing. If I can. This here is hyperbolic space. Here we have the city space. These points here are conformal spheres. So the important point is that the Cartan geometry that we had at the beginning, the projective structure, by doing this, by reducing the group here, so this is the reduction of homonymy, I'm splitting it up, I'm splitting my manifold up into orbits where new, different Cartan geometries will appear. So here I have the Lorentz, so the Lorentz one. Here I have other metrics. Here, so here, and that's how I have a conformal. This no, 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 it's just completely general. Please do not hesitate to ask questions. Hmm. I do not think this is directly connected. Yeah, I'm just talking about the fact that the group, when I ask it to group here, when I ask it to preserve these things, it changes. It, I get a sub subgroup, and that subgroup doesn't act transitively. So I'm talking about the actual the space on which it's acting and the orbits of, of the action of that group on that. So it's not really, it's not, it's not, there's no, no, no linear representation. It's the action of the group. I'm changing the group, and so I'm seeing more, more things appear. I hope that's what you're trying to try to get it so far. As we can already see here that we've got that this is not scry, because you're leaving missing a line. Oh yeah, no, no, it's the same situation. Okay, so that's the, the first curve draw with decomposition. And so this is the, so this this is not my, I didn't draw this like this. I draw everything like this. This is a I can have to attribute the credit to Yannick. This drawing, and he said he said that you this might speak to you more than than my previous drawing. So I followed his advice. Yeah, so this is the structure here of what we're looking at, really. So this is your Minkowski space, and it's a classification looks like this. You're adding like a hyper hyperbolic space here. And here, so what's hyperbolic space? You have these. these this is in Lorentz space. So the induced metric on that. Two sheeted hyperbola rays here in Lorentz space, and for the city space, well, you, you know, what we get here. And here we have the conformal. I called it scribe, but I, that's just lack of a better name. Point. It's, 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 it corresponds to the null thing. Okay. Oh yeah. Sorry. So I, I wasn't very clear about that. The composition corresponds to the sign of x, and so. It gives you this is related to the type of your geodesic. Blue one is meant to be the time light geodesic. These are the light light geodesics. These are, of course, the time light geodesics. So we see that we get a nice display of different structures popping up just by, just by asking your structure to preserve them. The object tree. So as I've already said several times, this is completely general in the curved case, and we don't even need to have Einstein manifolds. Over. 
to see here. This is objectively compact matrix of this impulsive order has to be of order. You get that. So as I also remarked that we're missing a line over so this, this the null infinity we're getting here isn't the normal null infinity phi, top phi. We're missing a line over it. And uh, work by Ashtar Sarkar, Romano, and Hansen, that uh, you guys probably also know better than me on the physics side, um, they also suggest that we're also missing a line other places too. So the question is, where are all these missing lines? Can we find them? Okay, so the answer to, to going towards the answer of this is to look at a homogeneous model studied in, uh, in this article. Here, early in Christmas, and we're going to look at it from the point of view of projective grammar. And then we generalize the discussion here to this theory of homogeneity. It's a starting point. You'll see that there's a, an ambient here. Okay, I'm just going to have a glass of water. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Not, not very well. <laughs> so, how are we going to try and get the lines here? So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a different, so we're going to increase the dimension, look at just projective geometry, projective sphere in two dimensions. We're going to do this, play the same game. We're going to ask there to exist different things that the group has to preserve. Reduce the projective group by asking, by looking at a subgroup that preserves different things. First thing we're going to choose is a vector. Now, this time it's a vector. The index is in the right place. I thought it was in the wrong place. This time it is. And when we do this, we immediately split the sphere up into two parts. So, choosing this vector, we get two points here. They will be preserved, and then everything else is reduced. This is the first part of the orbit. Yeah, so then we can forget about these two points. We're going to forget about them and concentrate on this part. There will be a drawing afterwards. And then the next thing we're going to ask is uh, that the group preserve this, this metric. This metric in with an extra, you know, two extra dimensions. Now these are tracked anyway. I'm trying not I try not. Say tracked to, I'm trying not to use the word, which is why I'm mumbling a bit. <laughs> yeah, so all of these things with, with big indices are tracted, weight is tracked. So in this case, we get two, we get two densities, two natural densities here. So to these, are, we get a weight one density, that's this one. This phi here is the inverse metric of this. It's nice and invertible, and we've made, we've chosen some compatibility here. We want this vector here to be null. I, the word is, has come out the box now. I'll just <laughs> you, you've, you've, you really, you've unleashed the uh, the long thing. <laughs> we get we get these two things here. Now, what, what is interesting is that we have a, a what we have here is we have the date of H in lambda gives you a projective compactation of order two, if you know what that means. But it's not this curved orbit decomposition that we're interested. This one that is the impulsive order. Okay. The lambda is just the norm, it's like the norm of for homogeneous coordinates with the metric. This is this is a sort of scale. It's not it's not a it's not an accident that uh, this is a projective compactation of order two, and this is an idea of such a way. Okay, so we get these two densities and that are gonna give different different decompositions of so the first one is if we start looking at the orbit, so when you ask the group, calculate what the group is, you get this thing here. And then you can start uh, looking at the what the orbits look like. Okay, this is the Poincaré group. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, this is for me. It's just a group. It's just another group. That, uh, for you, for you, the, for you, Poincaré is very important. I guess it should be for me too. Since I'm talking about these. So, um, 
what we get is that we get the open orbit. So the sigma here, we're looking at the decomposition with respect to sigma. So sigma has a sign. And what we, do, what we see is that the group acts, uh, so the sigma actually splits up into different surfaces like this. So the parameterized by by lambda. And, and each of these surfaces here is, is, is what we're seeing is in the, in the slide, you see that it's, it's, it's things are starting to fly break over picture. But I'll try to try to convey in the, in the next picture. Um, and at the boundary, we get decomposition due to lambda. Now it turns out here that lambda is not, not at all important on the inside. You see, lambda doesn't behave well. Depends on sigma. But here, sigma disappears, and lambda becomes an important. I'll try to explain what I mean by that in the next slide. So, sorry, so the boundary splits up into three parts, which give you, which you know, so spry, spy. And so this is very, very interesting. Okay, so I'm going to skip this and go to the drawing so that you can see what I'm talking about. So what we've done is, so this is our projected sphere, and we've chosen a factor, a vector. So we've chosen two points, and we've excluded these two points. We've already, so what we've done is we've, we've taken our scissors, and we're going to cut these two points. Why, why is that important? Is that when we start looking at I, I is going to now give us curves over the manifold. Here. I'm not explaining this very well. It's clearer in my mind when I was when I was telling you this, when I was thinking about how to tell you this, but it's, it, now I'm saying it, it's not very clear at all. So this I here is going to give me a, a, like a vector field. Not real, not, not, but it's not actually a vector field. That doesn't matter. What's important is, is that you can project I at each point onto the tangent space of the sphere at that point. That's going to give you a nice vector field over your thing, as long as you choose a scale, you get a nice vector field. And you can look at the integral curves of this, this vector field. And so what is happening is, is that normally these are like circles that go around, these are great circles. But because you've chosen these two points, and you're reduce, you, you sort of cut them out. So you cut them, cut these circles, and they become lines. And so what you can start looking at is you can try to quotient out these lines and look what's, look what's underneath. What's, the, what's left as you quotient out the lines? What's left is the picture that we had Cool. I'm not sure this is very clear. This is, this is how this thing breaks up. And what we can do is we can look at this on the hemisphere here. We get a nicer picture of this. As we see that these, these lines are, are transversal to, to the plane. So I've tried to make, I've tried to add dimensions. Of course, we're in low dimension. We need more dimensions to, to, to really see all, all the things that are going on. Um, so here, this, this is, there's not much dimensions here because I need two dimensions more, so that I've only got one dimension. So there's no, no Lorentz Boltzmann companion. And what, I, what we can see in the picture, if we look very closely, uh, we can see that this is just the, this is just the one point projective, one point compactification of time. But in higher dimensions, this is the projective compactification of, of the underlying Lorentz space. What, what happens is, is that you cut the lines, and so you now the, these, these curved circle things are looking like lines. If we, if we straighten them out by choosing, like, by choosing um, uh, an affine chart, straighten them out, we see that they, they point upwards away from something. So we can try to cut them, to quotient out that figure. We, get, it's, it's, we quotient out that, and we see what's left over, and what we get is the previous picture, the projective compactification. Yeah, so the, the original picture here that we had. We're looking at, what we're getting is what we realize is that all of the lines, yeah, when you cut, when you, when you quotient them out, what you're looking at is precisely this same picture. What happens is, is that you get something that's like projected sphere in lower dimensions, when you quotient out globally, and each of the orbits corresponds to quotienting out the lines and the orbits, because the lines, if you, if you look, also look carefully, you see that the 
lines are going to be tangent to the orbits as well. They preserve. The orbit decomposition is completely preserved by this decomposition in line. I don't think that's very clear. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I think it's also another point as well. You have the projective compactation going on, but if you look at the specific, this is why I drew this surface here, if you look at the lambda equals zero, the lambda equals zero is very special, special section of this thing here, but it, it ties up nicely here and gives you a scar. You think about this as you, you choose a line and then you, the lambda equals zero is, very, is, is a very special section which gives you the conformal compactification. Now elsewhere, you're getting something that's lying over the projective conformation. Here in my mind, but uh, I don't think... These are the missing lines, of course, but the problem is, is that we've had to jump up a dimension and introduce an ambient space to start seeing them. But we don't need to do that, it turns out. Right. Okay, so this is what I was saying. Now, how do, how do I see this? Another way of seeing that this is that what's going to happen is that you realize this that, you look at this quotient here, this is what I'm doing by quotienting right now. I'm just, look, just projecting away onto a Lorentz space. What we can see here is that sigma is compatible with this quotient. So this is just the canonical projection, say, of Sn minus one into Sn, so there's this decomposition here. We see that sigma is compatible with that. So sigma is dropping down and giving me the decomposition that was before. Sigma is, this, this sigma, I can quotient it. it. It factors through the quotient. But lambda doesn't factor through the quotient globally. Lambda factors through the quotient only along the boundary. I can see that the, this, this, uh, this explanation I thought was very clear is, is, not, is not that clear. Okay, but I will plow on, if, unless there are some questions. I'm not doing very well for my time. Okay, so the idea is, is that this thing, this, this picture here, this picture is due to the authors, so all these, these other which are here, um, uh, is, covering the, is a covering the projective compactification. So we, we found the lines, but we've had to introduce an ambient space. How do we get rid of that ambient space? Okay, so also I wanted to illustrate here, but I don't think this is going to be very clear, since the picture wasn't clear, but also at the level of the ambient spaces in the projective, projectivization the picture here, there's a compatibility here. And this is, this is essentially saying that the track is, this is telling us how the track is. So the Rn plus two, you get to an Rn plus one by quotienting out I, which is a standard thing. If you do that, you look at the dual, then you see that you have, um, since I is now, you're going to have a canonical <coughs> protractor. So this thing here, this is index, not this one, a long time ago, this one here, index should be down, so you get this one back. So what you see is that you get, you completely get back all of the data. And when you do, when you look at the metric induced on this thing, you see that it becomes degenerate as it was before. So everything is completely compatible. That's the, the, the idea. And this is what I was saying about it. Lambda is giving you the exact decomposition of the four of the boundary. Okay, so based on all of this, we wanted to introduce, we wanted to start seeing how we can see this intrinsically. Can we get it just from the projective compactification without jumping up to higher dimensions and doing a cover with decomposition on a higher dimensional projective space? Um, and so the first thing is, is to make sure, to realize that in fact the definition, what the bundles, the line bundles that pop up in the previous picture have an intrinsic definition. Because lambda, we already had lambda on the boundary. We already had the decomposition on the boundary and it was already given by a density on the boundary that, that was, so that we didn't have an extension of it into, into the space. We only knew it about it on the boundary. And so that's the, 
the, the idea of, of defining pi and spi is that to deal with this ambiguity of only knowing along the boundary your, uh, your, your density. So you don't know lambda globally, you just know lambda is, is ground truth. So there are many different ways to extend it into the inside, and this line bundle is going to do it to first, keep tra track of it for first order. So the idea is, is to, what do I mean by this? That I'm going to look at the one jet, but the one jet I, already, I almost know the whole one jet, because I know lambda zero along the boundary. So I already know what the function is meant to be. I'm just missing how it's going to act in the radial direction. And this is how we want to just, this is, it turns out that this is the right, and this is what the definition should be, according to our previous picture. So I'm pulling back this, this, this here, so this, the fact that I don't, I don't know how it's behaving off the boundary, I pull this back here, this bundle back along this, <coughs> this section of this. No, that's that's tie and spy. So we have an, an intrinsic definition of tie and spy. And when we work, if we work it out, we, when we work out the, in the curved case, we can see that the structure on the boundary is, is completely this. This is, this is what it is. This is what, even in the other case, this is, so the tie and spy have an intrinsic definition. But now the question is that we also got structure on tie and spy. Is that intrinsic too? <laughs> they're, they're lying over the projective decomposition of this line bundles over it. So the, the, the other picture was covering it. So th this is an intrinsic definition. But the question is, can we get any structure on this? And it turns out that if we, when we studied the curved or the decomposition in this language, we realized that there were there were intermediate structures going on. Intermediate Cartan geometry structure. And in particular, we realized that there was a structure that is like projected, that is like projected geometry, except that now we're going to allow in the group some things to act trivially. This is an unfaithful, unaffected. So instead of looking at the one way to describe it would be to be looking at all of the planes in Rn plus two that contain the, 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 the Ia I chosen, the, the, the vector I chosen, or we could, I, I think it's, the, another way of describing it is the set of projected lines passing through a point R. So it's very similar to what we had before, except the group is bigger. And it has these components here that do not act. We can't see them acting. This is why there's, there's a kernel. So you, you may say, well, well, well what does this? Uh, so this is a big kernel because it's a you know it's a continuous kernel. So it's going to, it's going to be see, we can see it at the infinitesimal level. So the question is that in, that means that they're going to be, and here sorry also one thing I should point out is that down here this is just the, the usual projective. So we've got a, something that contains the projective group and we have extra degree components which act trivially. We don't see them, but we see them in the kernel. We see that we'll see them in the Kaplan kernel. So that, that's the remark I wanted to make is that if you quotient out this kernel, we get the quotient you have is you take the group and you say, oh, this kernel, I don't want to see it, get rid of it, and you, 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 you get back the usual projective group. Okay, and it turns out that, so you might say, okay, but this makes no sense because uh, how am I going to find these degrees of freedom? I mean, Normally, these non-effective structures sort of arise when you look at like a substructure within a bigger structure, and then the non-effective parts are like the remains 
of the of the ambient space structure. So it, it might seem like a crazy idea to even imagine that, the, that we can we can specify what they are because there's no ambient space. And it turns out that we ha we do have enough information because of the introducing a metric and introducing this you know doing the full Holland reduction we do get unique way to define, to lift our projective geometry, our canonical projective geometry to this non-reflective geometry and determine this is what the Kaplan connection looks like. So here we get our usual projective connection, the normal part, Kaplan projective connection I was talking about earlier. We get these parts that we don't know what they are. They could be anything. But it turns out they're completely determined by what goes on in the Kaplan. That's, that's dry and And there's also more magic that happens. So th this thing here, just, just to explain, this is a structure that lives on, 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 on M. So we still don't see the line, we don't see this acting on the line bundle. So this is acting on the lower level. We've got a structure here that lives down below. We've still got these line bundles, but we don't know how it is getting any structure on that. Um, but it turns out that there's this magic that happens that in fact, this thing, when you look really closely, you realize that it's a pullback of a structure that would be living on time as well. And this is because when you pull it all back to the boundary points, so your, your hemisphere here, so you pull it all back to the equator, then what happens is, is that it only depends on the choice of section of time. So you're looking at this thing in a local trivial identity. That's what it's telling you. And it's is all completely coherent when you look at it like that. You get a projective structure on the times phi, which is what you expect to have, and it reduces down to this Aurelian geometry. We get Kaplan geometry. Um, that means we have a you know we have a strong Aurelian metric, but we also have this Kaplan connection. And all of this data is completely determined. We haven't had to add any extra ingredients. So we managed to recover along the boundary the, the structure that we saw in, the, in this ambient space structure. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. I, was ho I hope it was enjoyable, if not clear. But uh, thanks for listening anyway.